Good afternoon. Dave, how are you? Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How about you? Oh, not too bad. Not too bad. Excited to be back in the studio. It's kind of kind of lonely in here today, all by myself <laughs> in this this big studio. I'm looking through this this uh, two way glass. There's no one sitting there. Our producer is somewhere in a basement, uh, somewhere in Ottawa. I'm not <laughs> not certain exactly where, but um, but today we are talking about. Um, sorry, remote video production with Pearl Hardware Encoders. Now, of course, we are live streaming to Crowdcast, so we're going to give a few minutes for our Crowdcast folks to, to get logged on, maybe get settled in. Um, we've been hosting these webinars for quite a while, and um, it seems like every time we go to do one, you know, we run into, um, run into a few hiccups, which is pretty, pretty normal for live production work. How are we doing um, numbers-wise, Dave? Can you see that on the um, on the chat window that you have there? Yeah, let me just check. A couple people are are coming in on chat. Uh, so we got yeah, we're getting up there in people. Um, still people joining, so maybe we'll wait another minute or two and let a let a few more um, come along. But do say hello in in chat and let us know what's going on. We do have a separate section for asking questions. So please, uh, as we go through, um, let us know what your questions are. We'll try to answer them while we're going, um, but we'll definitely get to them at the end if we don't if we don't manage to address them as we go through. Um, and there is an uplink uh, feature inside of that question. So if you want to go in and someone's already got a question that interests you, give it give it an upvote, and that helps us to know that that's one we should address more immediately. And we'll try to get to all the questions if we can, at least by the end. Yeah, for sure. There's a there's a chat on the side, so make sure to tell us where you're watching from today. And if you do have any specific questions, like Dave said, make sure to put those in the questions box, and that way we'll make sure to address all of those. We tend to lose the questions if they end up in the chat too much. Uh, we are going to also be looking at a few polls today. So as you see, the polls appear on the bottom of the screen. Please make sure to participate in those polls again, just also on the bottom. So if you answer on the chat, we won't really be able to ingest that information as well as if you participate in the chat panel on the bottom itself. Yep. So people are letting us know where they're from. We got people from Orlando, the Netherlands, Columbia, Wisconsin, all over the place. Uh, so wow. that's great. Uh, someone from Vienna just just checked in. So we're still getting people joining, um, but maybe we'll, we'll we'll get going. We'll start at least introducing the agenda as other people come in, and then we'll we'll get into the meat of uh, of the presentation. Yeah, for sure. So um, I'm in our studio here in Ottawa. Dave is right in his house, uh, just a little bit outside of Ottawa. Dave is the VP of marketing here at Epifan, and I am now a remote video producer. I used to be a real video <laughs> producer, but now I'm a remote video producer, and I added Ninja onto the end of my title, which I thought was kind of fun after a, a project we did recently. But um, we are with Epifan Video. Uh, Epifan Video makes reliable, easy-to-use hardware for capture, streaming, and recording. And uh, we know a few things about video production. We're still learning as we go. Um, you know, like a lot of folks are in this kind of changing time that we're in, but we've been doing video remote kind of before it was cool, uh, or before it was like, you know, government mandated. Um, we started a project uh, almost a year and a half ago where we were focusing on how do we control a remote studio and what tools do we need and, and how can we make those workflows work? And, um, it was a lot of a lot of trial and error, but um, you know we learned a lot along the way, and we've able been able to apply that in the last uh, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. How many months has it been in lockdown now? Um, it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. But I think everybody's everybody's facing that same challenge, right? Is is if they were producing video before, how do they keep that going? How do they do it in a in an age where people can't be you know multiple people in a studio with a production team? And that's really what we're here to talk about today is how do you how do you continue to produce that great quality of video that you you're used to doing in a kind of in-person environment? How do you take that to a remote production kind of workflow? And as Cameron said, we've been kind of battling that for the last six months or so. And and every every time we do it, we get a little bit better at it. We learn a few more things and we want to share what what we've kind of learned and, and how we're using some of Epifan's own equipment to accomplish that. Yeah, that's right. So 
Um, I can kind of jump us into the agenda here. We can pop that up on the screen and we'll go through that real quick. So uh, the few things we're going to talk about today, we're going to be looking at elements of remote video production, um, you know, bringing in remote guests and what those workflows look like, remote video production with the Pearl, so our actual hardware itself. We're kind of going to run through a little bit of a walkthrough and show you some high level views of that, that workflow there. And we're going to take some time at the end and address all your questions. So. Uh, Dave might see a question that it might pop up during the presentation. We'll definitely address those if we have any, you know, hot, hot questions that come up. But we're definitely going to hold on to the questions to the end so we can make sure that we get those all covered off. So please make sure to stick around way until the end of the end of the webinar and we'll make sure to cover all those questions if you have any. Yeah, so maybe let's let's dive into the first the first one, which is elements of a remote production. So first, I guess we need to define what we mean by remote video production. We talked a little bit about that uh, in terms of our use case, but but in general, we're talking about cases where the producer and the, the on-camera talent are not in the same location. So they're, they're distant from one another, and perhaps even the equipment which is being used to execute the production is also in yet another location altogether. And that's, that's the scenario that Cameron and I and and Adam, who's producing our show today, that's that's how we are. We're all in three different locations, and the gear that we're using is yet in a fourth location. So that's what we mean by remote production. It's being able to control the gear and interact with each other as as though you were in a studio, or at least as close as you can get to being in a studio together. Um, and often we're talking about involving um, professional grade audio and video equipment. Um, so not webcams and those kind of things, but a production where you want to get to the next level with some good quality audio and lighting and camera signals. So we're going to talk a little bit about that equipment. Not a lot about the equipment itself, just know that you need some decent equipment to start with and, and we'll talk about that. And then um, last but not least, you're going to need um, a really good network connection as well. So um, we'll, we'll get into those details as well. Which might, uh, which might be a little bit of a crux for us today. Um, you know, we're, we live in Canada, we operate out of Canada, and sometimes we're at the subject, or we're at the mercy of our carriers when we don't have the best signals. Uh, Dave has traditionally had the best signal, and we've noticed a little bit of a dip in his SRT quality, or the SRT quality of the network connection today. But uh, hopefully it won't cause any problems, and if it does, we'll just kind of roll with that as, as we go. So far, it's looking pretty good, though, and it's improved since we did our rehearsal earlier as well. Yeah, so you, you just never can tell, but you, you deal with the, with the Internet you have. Um, and that, you know, that, that's one of the variables here is a robust network, uh, as you see at the bottom of this slide, is a must. So you, you do need a good quality network. It doesn't have to be, you know, a dedicated managed fiber link or anything but it does need to be of decent bandwidth at least and reasonable reliability um, the other thing you're going to need in your setup um, some pro grade cameras so so some cameras typically that can be controlled remotely so things like ptz cameras or z cams those kind of things where the remote producer can get in and control that camera remotely and adjust things on the fly so that they you know, they don't have to have everything set up in advance. They can make changes right in the rehearsal or right on the fly during the production. That's that's an important kind of item to be able to control that camera. And then video switcher, as we're using here today, you can see uh, Adam will be switching different layouts as we have slides or we have just Cameron and, and myself or we have just myself in the slides. So we're, we're using a video switcher for that. We happen to be using our, our Pearl for that um, purpose. But any video switcher um, can work here. But again, you need control over that switcher. So if the producer is remote from that gear, you're going to want something you can control. And similarly with your audio mixing and your lights. So you want to be able to control pretty much everything that's going on in the studio. Uh, so lighting, sound, cameras, and then your switching uh, and your encoding. And that's really the gear that we look at as the essentials of the toolkit that you're going to need to even get started with a remote production. Now, if we were to kind of talk about some of the exam or some of the stuff that we have in our studios here, um, I'm yep. using a Z Cam here in our studio. Uh, we got on board with the Z Cam I think late last year, mid last year, and it's an awesome little camera. We're actually using the baseline one, but it works really well for remote setups. 
Uh, right now, I'm kind of struggling with the autofocus. Um, <laughs> it's not recognizing me as a human, so I'm not sure what that says about me. But um, there, and there was also a recent update to the app, so I think I might have flubbed it a little bit right before we got started, which is you know kind of par for the course. But um, we're using that in our studio. Everything about that camera can be accessed remotely. We're going to take a look at that a little bit later in the webinar today and get into the actual interface and how that works. But you know, using a remote connection into the studio, our producer can adjust the uh, the exposure, the frame rate, even the, the uh, quality that we can output from this camera. We can do up to 4K on this particular model. Right now, we're just doing 1080, and we can actually up that as well. And everything about the camera, with the exception of how we can actually physically move it, um, we can we can do that remotely for our studio setup. Now, for our switcher, we are using a Pearl for today, so. Everything that we're sending to Crowdcast and also as part of this YouTube VOD that you might be watching. We're doing all of that switching and that switching is actually being accessed remotely by our remote producer, Adam, who's working behind the scenes today. And that Pearl itself is not even at this site. So I'm using a Pearl to, to contribute my SRT feed and that's going up to a remote Pearl, which Adam is accessing. And a little bit more for this setup here, I'm using an audio mixer. Again, it's a networked audio mixer, so it's something that Adam can access. And he was making some tweaks earlier because my MacBook is going into meltdown mode with all the stuff that I'm running off of it. So he was tweaking to take that fan noise out. Now we've got some, just have a graphic up on the screen here just to give you an idea of what this setup might look like. So for our remote production space, we'll have a camera, we'll have some lighting. For this one, we've got a, a one-point light set up. Maybe there's some natural light coming in from either side. And then on the desk, there's our Pearl Mini and a little local mixer. So that would be enough for our, um, our remote production space with a contributor via SRT to send their connection to the remote producer. Now, Dave, um, I know your camera isn't accessible online, but why don't you tell us a little bit more about your audio setup that you, um, that you just configured earlier? Yeah, so mine's fairly simple. So I've just got a, a basic little Canon M200 camera that I'm using on a tripod that's just sitting in front of me. And then I've got just a classic kind of, it's a AT4040 Audio Technica mic, and I'm just plugging that directly into my Pearl Mini. So I'm sending my feed into the production uh, via SRT from my Pearl, and we'll get into those details a little later. But I really just have my mic plugged directly into my Pearl, and then from there it's capturing that audio and sending it with my camera signal up into the production, and, and that's where Adam can switch me in and out of these layouts and do all of that stuff. So my setup is, is quite simple, and I don't have gear that's remotely controlled in the environment that I'm in, but of course, Cameron in the studio, we've gone to the trouble of having mixers and things that can be remotely accessed by the producer. So I'm kind of on my own in this island, but uh, in the studio we have capability for Adam to really take control of everything. That's right, and we've also been experimenting with some uh, remote lighting solutions as well that include uh, DMX interfaces. So the DMX protocol is one that's used often um, in stage lighting and set lighting where you can send commands to multiple lights over a network. Now. Um, Yep. We had that set up in our Palo Alto studio. We had an a incubator down there that we were playing around with some different technology. And that was really cool because then our remote producer could access everything about the actual, um, the actual lighting and setup. Um, kind of the most important part of this whole thing is our network setup as well. Now, for us, because you know, we're running this studio in a corporate office, it's very important that we are maintaining security on that network. So we use a VPN in order for our remote producers to log into the gear that we have here, to log into my contributor, um, Pearl2 as well. And that's something to consider if you're gonna be setting up a remote production studio. You wanna make sure that it's not open to the, to the world of nasty people that might try to interfere or mess with, your, mess with your connections. And it might not even be anyone that's looking to, you know, attack your organization or production. There's folks that just search for open ports on the internet kind of just to have fun with them, um, have fun with messing people, messing with people that have left their devices unprotected. Yep, it's a good point. All right, let's dive into some of the two workflows. So we've got two workflows that we've kind of been using over the last several months. We started with one, we evolved to another. Um, and the whole idea here is to be able to bring that remote guest into the production. So somebody who's offsite, what do they need? How do you get them in there? Um, so we started out 
using Zoom um, for that. So that seemed to be the easiest way when suddenly, you know, the office was off limits and we were thrust into our homes and said, okay, continue on with live shows and webinars. This is what we did. Um, so we joined a Zoom call and then we fed that Zoom call. So we had a computer terminating that, that Zoom client and then fed that gallery signal over HDMI into the Perl. And then in the Perl, we were able to then crop out the individual hosts that we wanted to be in the, the production itself and use that in our layouts to be able to switch them in and out of the production. And this is not without some, some strange workflow and caveats, but in general, it works pretty well. Um, however, the downsides that we did come across were that the audio quality and the video quality through Zoom is not the highest and it's variable. So it really depends on what's going on one day might be better than another. And in general, it's just not very high quality. It's not high resolution in terms of the video. Um, so we did find that the workflow was a little messy and could run us into trouble on occasion and that the quality wasn't the best. And so we were seeking something that would kind of resolve these two issues, but give us the same flexibility to be able to bring people in from wherever they are. Yeah, that's right. We were pretty. Um, we used that pretty or pretty heavily in the early days, and it worked really well. But uh, it was definitely time to up up that workflow and um, and kind of move past it. And as well, if you've been on a Zoom call, you've noticed that the people are always moving around in the gallery, and and it's whatever quality we're getting from the webcams too, which wasn't great. So now we're looking at this much more advanced workflow. We're actually injecting SRT into our productions. So um, SRT streaming is something that we added in. Uh, Dave, do you remember which firmware or when we added that in? That was um, a few months ago, <laughs> but we've added that I, in as a streaming I don't, protocol. I think it was 412, but I'm not certain. Um, but yeah, it's been a few months now that we've had that out. Yeah, and, and SRT is, is this really cool protocol because of course it was purpose built for this. It wasn't something that was built for some, like built for file transfers or other kind of, um, other kind of transferring file types over networks, SRT was always intended just for actually sending video over, um, over networks and over the internet. And it works really well to get over, um, get over firewalls and, and through different routers and it can be um, sent in different ways and redirected, which makes it a very strong, uh, kind of a strong source. We'll take that SRT source from a Perl Mini or another uh, Epifan hardware device like the Perl 2, for example, or even the Perl 1 will support this protocol. There's also software and uh, other hardware solutions that you can use to send this signal. We send that over the internet into our Perl 2, and that's our SRT destination. And then from there, our producer is able to mix and switch and put those together and then uh, end up right back into the production again. And that's one of the questions I see popped up and has a, a vote on it in our Q&A section here is, um, is there an SRT encoding software like OBS, which could you know, capture a signal and then uh, send an SRT stream to their remote Perl 2? And the answer is yes. So, you know, Cameron and I today are using uh, Perls as both the head end, that's the production machine, as well as the contribution encoder. But there are apps you can get even for for iOS. There's software you can run on, on a PC or a Mac. So there is a variety of ways you could be creating SRT if your remote guest does not have an Epifan Pearl Mini or a Pearl or something. So there are definitely some options there. And there are even some cameras now that are coming to market that have SRT built in directly as well. So I think as SRT gets more and more popular, you'll see even more options. And there's there's already quite a few that we can we can talk about. Um, so let's, no, I, I, let's sorry, maybe Dave, talk I a little bit about SRT itself. We've, we've mentioned it a whole bunch of times, but maybe we'll explain a little bit more about how it behaves and why we like it so much. Yeah, totally. And this is a great chart. Uh, this kind of shows the range of different streaming protocols that are available now for, for end users. And, um, you know, we'll see as far as, you know, as far as one side of the chart, we're looking at over 60 plus uh, seconds of delay and then all the way up to 80 seconds of, or sorry, 80 milliseconds of delay when it comes to SRT streaming. Now, HLS is the top one on the chart here. And HLS is the kind of format that you'll see come in for Netflix or if you're watching Apple TV at home. So it's perfectly fine to have a super long buffer to make sure that you've got a super high quality of video coming in on that stream. 
but it's not something that works really well for interactivity or broadcast or, or anything else. Um, the next down is uh, HDS or Dash or MPEG Dash, and that's still pretty smooth and it can get you to a, a lower latency as well. RTMP is the protocol that we're all familiar with for live streaming, and again, that one's been around for a long time, and obviously our, um, our big CDNs like YouTube and Wowza are supporting, supporting RTMP, but it wasn't something that was purpose-built for actual video transfer, and it doesn't work as well for getting that low, low latency. Um, skipping all the way ahead to SRT, that's where you know, we're in that sweet spot now where we can get you know, all the way from one second right down to 80 milliseconds of delay, which works really well for these kinds of productions. And um, you can make sure that we have multiple contributors all coming in. With the Perl itself, we can change what those um, delays are so that if maybe one contributor has a, has a little bit of a weaker network, we can slow everybody down and bring them all back in sync in the Perl itself. Yeah, and that's really key for SRT is the ability to use that latency um, lever if you want to mm -hmm. accommodate a very unpredictable network. Um, and as we mentioned at the top of the webinar today, my network is a bit of a disaster today, but SRT is doing a very good job at managing that. So there's all kinds of packets getting dropped and things getting lost, but SRT under the hood is retransmitting all of that. And it does it in a way, as Cameron said, that it was built to, to carry video from the beginning. So it's not using the traditional file-based uh, protocols underneath. Um, so it's not using TCP and it's not using UDP. It's a separate transport layer uh, built into SRT and it really allows you to trade off latency and things like that in order to accommodate your network. So you can tune it to the network that you have and get the best performance out of it. So it's, it's great for that. Yeah, it's that perfect marriage of low latency and high quality and it really makes it um, kind of the key or sorry, the, the best method of transferring video for these kinds of remote contributor setups. Now, we talked a little bit about one example. We've talked about how we use, uh, use Zoom previously. And in this chart here, we really illustrate what we're doing right now. So we're still using a mix of Zoom. We're using SRT. And just to kind of take you from left to right, uh, Adam, if you want to blow this one up full screen, um, way on the left, we've got our remote guest. Now, for us, we're doing our presentations via Zoom. So kind of get into the detail here on that. Our remote guest is contributing a camera feed with audio via the Pearl Mini on the laptop or desktop computer. They're sharing a presentation. So right now I'm actually sharing a presentation local on my laptop. And that, um, that Zoom screen share is being captured into the Pearl 2 and then being injected into this presentation along alongside of my SRT feed or Dave's SRT feed, depending on... Um, SRT feed rather, depending on what the layout is. Now our producer who's working remotely, uh, Adam again is taking those sources, he's mixing them together on the Pearl 2 and we're bringing that back uh, back out to our CDN at the bottom and on the right hand side of course that's Dave's contribution as well with the Pearl Mini and, and uh, camera feed coming in and alongside with all this, um, all these ins and outs in the Pearl, we're also using Zoom as a confidence monitor. So we found that Zoom works very very well for actually feeding a signal out from the Perl 2 on one of our HDMI out ports. And then that's going back into Zoom. And then that way Dave and I can actually see what's happening live on the production itself within the Zoom meeting that we're also interacting with each other on the, um, on the back end for our, our communication. So um, if your brains are exploding right now, that's, <laughs> that's totally normal. This, um, this, this workflow is a lot to, a lot to ingest, but um, you know, we're using all of these pieces where we've put them all together for this workflow itself. And, um, you know, the Zoom is really powering our, uh, our communication between Dave and I because with the delays, even though they're very short with SRT, it's not very conducive for us to have a conversation with each other like we are now, like we can do in Zoom. And then we can actually mix that back together on the production side. Now, we did have a couple of polls. A, no. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, that's another one of the questions we have in the Q&A is someone's asking, are you using RTMP for uploading and SRT for downloading the stream or altogether SRT? So I think if I interpret that question correctly, all of the video that's going from my home or Cameron's studio 
is going up to the production uh, pearl using SRT. So if that's what you mean by uploading, that's that's SRT going that direction. From there, from the production pearl, we're actually going to Crowdcast. We're using RTMP uh, for that little section. And the reason there is it just doesn't support SRT yet. Um, so we're, we're getting our contribution feeds into the production pearl all with SRT. And then in terms of the feed that we get back, that's all done, as Cameron said, with Zoom. So I'm watching the production through Zoom as Adam has fed it back through our production off of, off of the Pearl 2. So it's a little bit convoluted, but it's a mix of Zoom for us to communicate and then SRT for us to get our video and audio signals up into the production. So hopefully, hopefully that's clear. If not, ask again and we'll try to, we'll try to clarify <laughs> as we go. Yeah, exactly. Or I'll throw our uh, support team to the wolves. I'll say, start a, a live chat with one of our support team members and they'll explain it all to you as well. Um, <laughs> I'm yep. not making any We have another in the question here asking, your laptops are not feeding into the Pearl Minis, only the cameras. Um, so in my case, yes, it's my camera mm -hmm. and my microphone directly into my Pearl Mini and that's sending up to the production Pearl. In Cameron's case, he's sending the video from his camera directly into the Pearl, but his screen share is actually going through Zoom. Um, so in that case, yes, he's using his laptop to, to open up that presentation, and then he's actually sending that to the production Pearl over Zoom. So it's, it's a real combination of SRT and Zoom. We tend to use SRT for kind of the live um, camera signals, and we use Zoom for this for the slide share portion when we're getting our content into the production. Totally, and we um, we can of course send the uh, the screen share via the Pearl as well. So we could do that via an SRT stream, but it's we found it's a better experience for the hosts so that they can actually see what the screen share is locally again through Zoom. And just to clarify a little bit more, um, we are integrating or we've. Um, uh, we're mixing in Zoom into our production Pearl 2 by way of using a laptop. So as you can see in this illustration just under the producer icon, there is a laptop that's running Zoom and that's connected to the Pearl Correct. 2 and that's how we're getting that video signal out. And then of course the video signal back into Pearl, excuse me, back into Zoom using an AVIO encoder which is a, a screen grabber just connected via USB 3 and that's bringing that HDMI signal right into the Pearl. Yeah. So clear as mud. Now uh, we do yeah, have some it's other complicated. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You said you said convoluted, but I prefer advanced and um, and leading edge. I think that's the we'll, we'll use that term. Um, we we do have some other webinars, of course, uh, getting a little bit more into the weeds about SRT uh, remote workflows and a little bit more detail on there. If you'd like to learn more, please check out our website for uh, for our webinars, and um, and of course, last week I believe it was last week we had uh, Tim. From Wow's on, or maybe it was the week before, but uh, George and Tim were talking about how uh, Wowza is actually supporting SRT ingestion. So, like Dave mm -hmm. mentioned, we are sending an RTMP feed to Crowdcast from the Pearl 2, but some CDNs also support SRT streaming, which is obviously something that we can do with the Pearl as well. If you want to send your SRT stream to a to a CDN and even have that lower lower latency and you get really close. And we're looking at like almost quicker than broadcast in some some situations here with uh, with SRT and and uh, remote viewing on a browser for viewers wherever they are in the world. Yeah, and we've seen events like the NFL draft and other very big um, kind of prominent events use SRT in lieu of the traditional broadcast uh, mechanism, and I think that really goes to show. You know, SRT was developed to kind of replace that old satellite truck kind of production workflow and say, hey, we've got public internet. Let's use that instead of having to roll a satellite truck out to every event. And we're starting to see more and more events use it in that very kind of professional, kind of high pressure situation. So uh, we know the protocol is very capable. We've seen it used all over the place. And you know, Wowza and many others are now, um, well, Wowza was one of the first actually, but many, many others are, are supporting the protocol now and, and making it easy for, for us to be able to kind of join in that ecosystem and give our customers lots of choice. Exactly. And, and just like Dave mentioned for the NFL draft, 
They were using this really cool SRT setup where they had multiple, and not just a few feeds. I mean, they had dozens of SRT feeds coming in. and 600, the, I think they said. Yeah, just the hundreds, crazy. Of, hundreds of SRT feeds, which is just insane. Um, but obviously a big team to manage that and a lot of hardware powering that. Um, something similar that we can do with multiple SRT contribution again over the, uh, over the internet and then right into the Pearl 2 and then of course out via the CDN. Now just to get a little bit closer in we can take a look at some of the settings that we have or some of the, some of the menus that we have around SRT. So Adam if you could punch in a little bit deeper we'll kind of explain what we're seeing here. On the, uh, on the left hand side of the screen we've got a split here between um, our Pearl UI and a close-up of the actual configuration or some of the stats there but we're seeing Dave's feed is coming in um, on this connection we're able to tell what the resolution is what our frame rate is of course the bit rates um, some of the important details that we're looking at here are our round trip time because that round trip is really going to tell us you know how much that signal is getting bounced around on the network and how strong it is and maybe if you need to introduce a little bit more latency on the stream itself. Uh, packet loss, of course, is very important. So if you're not familiar with what packet loss is, a uh, pretty simple way to explain it is if you're watching something and, and the pixels start to fall off or it gets a little bit grainy, that could be because of packet loss and you know those information packets that are traveling over the network just aren't being uh, received properly. So we're able to tell what our packet loss is, again, so that we can identify how we can uh, maybe adjust the stream settings, maybe adjust the resolution, uh, you know, take a look at our bandwidth as well. But in this example, we've got a pretty low packet loss. This one's 0.91 in the screenshot. And uh, for this one, it had been running for about eight minutes with, you know, packets uh, being resent just in the low 1600 range. That was, that was pretty low. Now, when it comes to um, our SRT functionality on the Pearl, we can support the three different kinds of connection modes. So in this example, we're looking at rendezvous, but uh, we've been working a lot more with caller listener mode, which makes it a lot easier for setup and getting things started on the uh, on the contributor side. Yep. All right. Now I think um, just looking at our run through here, um, we talked about the Perl and kind of how that works. Now, a little bit more detail on uh, what we can actually accomplish with the different hardware that we have within the Pearl family. Uh, the Pearl Mini is our uh, smaller hardware box. It's a little bit more affordable, and um, that fits within, or sorry, that sits within the first category that you can see on the chart here. Now, for SRT inputs and outputs, we're looking at one SRT input into the Pearl, but you can actually output up to three SRT um, channels from the Pearl itself. So that means you could run your camera. You'd be able to run maybe an alternate camera from that Pearl Mini and then a screen share if you wanted to do that or you know even another camera source. The Pearl 2 is much more robust. It's a much more horsepower under the under the hood with that. And we're looking at six SRT inputs and uh, six SRT outputs. Now of course these are our recommended numbers. I've pushed this a little bit further in our testing and some of our productions and you know you start to see a little bit uh, a little bit of performance. Um, uh, gap on there, but still very, uh, very powerful, and there's a lot you can do with that, uh, that many inputs and outputs into the Pearl. Now, I think we have a couple yeah. more poll questions. We did talk about the poll, uh, have you ever produced video remotely? So please let us know how you've been, um, how you've been doing that maybe the last few months, um, and how often do you bring in remote guests into your video productions? I'm gonna guess, you know, probably often right now we're seeing a lot more, uh, a lot more folks that are looking for solutions around actually having remote contributors into these feeds. And our last one, just to catch us up on all the on the polls that we've been running through, have you used SRT yet? So tell us, have you used it before? Is this the first time that you've heard of it? Are you trying to Google the acronym SRT and you're getting all these crazy results? Um, maybe you just saw like a Ford Mustang pop up onto your screen or. You're looking at subrep uh, transcriptions, which is um, you know a totally different file format for for uh, lower thirds and, and captioning. Um, SRT, of course, stands for Secure Reliable Transport, but um, but you have to make sure that you're looking for SRT streaming protocol if you're searching for that online. Now, I think we can get into an example. So um, Dave, if you're ready, I think we can 
uh, pop into, I'll just actually end our screen share in a second here. And I'd like to take us through the whole flow of maybe logging into AV Studio, bringing in, um, bringing in some layouts and kind of looking at that whole, that whole deal. Our producer, sure. Adam, um, he's going to take us through. So Dave and I will kind of direct him through these different screens. And, um, and once he's all ready, we'll see, that, we'll see that pop up again on here. There we go. Yeah, so uh, Adam's already in the actual uh, Perl UI itself. Now, if you're familiar with AV Studio, AV Studio is, um, is our platform for remote access to the Perls or the Perl family of encoders. So with an AV Studio account, what you can do is actually program your Perl to be available on AV Studio wherever it is. So if you send your Perl out into the field and, um, and maybe you have someone just connect it to, to, a, to a router or internet connection, that's all you need in order to then access that, that controller. So Adam, why don't you take us into, um, into our production Perl just by, by logging in just like you were a moment ago there. Yeah, we, we will typically use a mix of, of VPN and AV Studio. So of course we use AV Studio to control the Perls itself. Um, but at the beginning of the webinar, we talked about the need to be able to control all the equipment that's in your studio environment or your production environment. So we use uh, a VPN to be able to access things like UI for our, our remote controlled mixer and mm -hmm. the DMX lights that Cameron spoke about and the Z cam. So when we want to control those elements, um, we're doing that through a VPN. So that allows us to easily access those. Um, but when it comes to the Perl, we do have AV Studio, which allows us to, to pop in to, to the web UI for the Perl, even if it's behind a firewall, it's very firewall friendly. So you can get in behind there and then be able to control things remotely. And that's, that's what Adam's uh, kind of showing us right now. This is this is the web UI. Yeah. All right. So I just heard Adam in my ear there. He says he's back into the into the Perl UI. And right now we're actually just looking at the layouts for our actual program today. But um, if we were to uh, go over on the uh, far left hand side, we can see for our inputs we've got our SRT one host. We have our SRT uh, two host, and those are the ones we're actually bringing in. Dave's and I, uh, Dave and I's signal on directly. Now, um, Adam's just taken us to to my input on here, or sorry, Dave's uh, Dave's input just updated on there. Um, we can see his image coming in. We can see what the uh, what the actual audio levels are coming in, so we can troubleshoot any audio um, any audio issues on that, and also be able to take a look at some of the statistics. So that um, screenshot that we shared with you earlier, that's where we can see those live stats actually right on this frame here. Now, um, Adam, I think the Epifan Live interface should be working. So why don't you click on that guy on the top right and we'll, um, we'll bounce into that if it's, there we go. So Epifan Live um, is a, another tool that we use for remote production. Now on the right hand side, Adam, just take us into our, our switcher menu. So um, you can actually configure that dashboard that we were just looking at with different details, different channels. But um, this is really where the magic happens for our live productions. This view is awesome. This gives our remote producers um, a pretty close to um, live refresh on all of the layouts that we have pre-configured on the Perl. Um, all the channels that we have are available here. So Adam, if you want to yeah, give us a couple of switches through some of these, um, some of these layouts just to give us an example. Um, Adam remotely is able to see with confidence what's happening on those channels. So for example, if you have a presenter that's doing a slide share and um, you know, you're not looking at that slide share input within the Perl UI, you could actually see it within that uh, Epifan Live window there. And, and then Adam, why don't you take us back again one more time. There we go, just to, the, um, just to our screen share or your screen share. And then on the top left corner, we can take a look at what we've got in that pull down. So um, in Epifan Live, we've got these all the channels that are configured on the Perl. So on the live stream channel itself, you'll be able to see that pre-roll from the beginning of the webinar. That's the one that we had our, um, our NDI titling in. 
uh, Adam obviously don't launch that one or else we'll lose our audio there. And then our, um, our outro layout, which will have come up at the, at the end of the webinar. So Adam's able to very easily control what's actually being outputted live on Crowdcast. And of course, we're also simulcasting on YouTube and, um, and Twitch TV right now, which is all done on that same channel. Now, um, I think some of the other details that we can take a look at that, on, or take a look within the Perl, if we go back to the actual Perl UI, maybe I can explain that just a little bit more. Uh, all those channels that I mentioned are listed along the left-hand side. So we've got a few different channels set up, all with different, uh, different uses and purposes. We generally only record off of the live stream channel, and that gives us a nice VOD backup, you know, maybe in the event that um, we have any issues with the stream to Crowdcast or YouTube, if those streams get interrupted, you know, we can't necessarily rely on that as a, um, as a solid backup, but we can record locally on the Perl. And um, even within that, there we go, and do not expand any of those, <laughs> any of those fields on there, Adam. But uh, you can see on the streaming tab that we had, um, obviously, YouTube, Crowdcast, and, uh, and Twitch. And I would say not to expand, just because within the Perl UI, we do reveal all of the um, all the stream key information so we're not quite ready to share that with our viewers today <laughs> nope sorry my um my earbud batteries are dying Give me one second so that that gives us a pretty good overview of the you know using av studio to go in control pearl you get access to the complete web UI of Perl so you can control everything that's happening there. And in fact, Adam could even log into my Perl mini here and adjust the settings that I have either for my audio, my video, any of that. Um, so as a remote producer, he's not only able to get control over the production Perl, but if I'm using another Perl device to contribute my SRT feed, um, I can I can pair that with his SR, with his AV Studio account or invite him into mine, and then he's able to control my Perl as well, which gives him complete control over what what's happening on the guest side as well as what's happening on the production side. So it gives him a lot of good control from wherever he may be sitting. Um, and then, Adam, if you get a chance, maybe you can um, show just how we access a couple of the other elements outside of Perl in the studio uh, something like our mixer, um, we can get the UI there, um, and you, there there, you can see our, our UI for the mixer there. Um, so we're able to control all of that. Adam's able to log in, and although that mixer is actually sitting closer to Cameron, well, much closer to Cameron than it is to Adam, <laughs> Adam's able to reach into the studio over a VPN and control all of that and adjust mic levels and all that kind of stuff. So these are the kind of tools that that we've been using over the last six, seven months. Um, I think we've had this mixer for longer than that, um, but certainly over the last six, six, seven months as we've been doing all these productions from home, these are the tools that were that are kind of behind the scenes. So a little bit of Zoom, a lot of SRT, a little bit of VPN, some a AV Studio to control the pearls that are all in the production. Um, and that's how we've kind of wrapped it up. So we've We've evolved, as Cameron said, we started with different workflows and as we wanted to up our quality and kind of change our workflow a little bit because there are some gotchas in the workflow that we started with with Zoom, as Cameron mentioned, sometimes the gallery view may shift around a little bit. Uh, someone drops out or someone adds into the call, all of a sudden things get resized and if you're cropping from that gallery view, um, that can throw off, off your production a little bit. So there are some caveats to doing it the way we started with, and that's really why we evolved. And um, we were very kind of fortunate, I would say, that SRT was on our roadmap for the time frame that it was because pretty much immediately after March and February came along, we were able to shift to an SRT workflow on the Pearl, and that made our life just so much easier and more predictable um, as, as both guests on our own shows and as producers of our own shows. Um, so... We're, exactly. we're learning as we go, but we've we've kind of come into a rhythm with it with SRT that's much more comfortable than what we had in the past. We had a, um, a live show recently with uh, a contributor from Bird Dog, and so Eamon was yes. all the way down in Australia, 
And that was one of the SRT contributor uh, contributing hardware pieces that Dave mentioned earlier, where they were actually sending the feed directly from the camera itself, which was very cool. And of course, um, mixing that in with the production with uh, George, it, it's seamless. It's just as if they're in the same room, you know, or they're on other sides of the planet, but with SRT, we're able to adjust those and it's, uh, it's worked very well. We did show a little bit of the Mixer UI. Now that Mixer UI, that interface doesn't exist in real life. So that Mixer itself does not have a physical interface. Uh, prior to lockdown, we'd use an iPad to access that interface, move our sliders up and down. And so now we just do it all on the browser, which is basically the same thing. And having all of that, uh, all that access and uh, control remotely is a huge, makes a huge difference for us. Now, um, Adam, I'm not sure, did we set up the camera or not? If we could jump into that one, I think that would be the last one we can show. And then we do have some poll results that I'd like to go over. And then of course, we're gonna uh, wrap up with taking a look at some of our questions as well before we, before we close out. Yeah. Now the, um, the camera that I mentioned before, we're using a Z cam. Now this is the, the base model Z cam that we have here in the office. And uh, like all the Zcam models, they're networkable, so it has an Ethernet port right on the back. It also can be um, logged onto your network via Wi-Fi, and you can access all the controls. It's got a nifty little app as well, which uh, which works really well and gives you a lot of different control. And if you have a VPN set up in your studio, you can also, you know, for myself, I've got the VPN connection set up on my phone, and so I can use that app over the network uh, via VPN. Um, just right in the app itself. The um, the web UI is not not as pretty as the um, not as pretty as the actual app UI, but it gets the job done. And for um, someone re working remotely, it's it's great to access. You can even start recording right on the camera itself from that UI if you wanted to do so. Now um, so we've got we... some polls coming in. Oh, sorry, Dave. Well, I was, I was going to say, we do have a bunch of questions to get to, so I'll start reading through there. If you want to look at the polls, I'll start gathering some of the questions here, and then we can we can get to answering. Yeah, for sure. So um, we've got some polls coming in. Now, 67% um, of voters are interested in producing both live and recorded content for their remote productions. Now, um, what we've had experience with uh, using SRT is that we can both do these live productions, obviously with our Pearl 2 uh, family of or Pearl family of encoders, but we can also make uh, VOD content, which works in exactly the same way. Instead of streaming live, we're just recording those ISOs right onto the Pearl hardware, so that we can make those um, make those assets available for editing, and we can clean everything up in post. And um, we've done that for a few different productions as um, recently, and it's worked really well as the actual production workflow. Um, I'm also seeing that about 50% um, aren't interested in bringing in remote guests. So um, hmm. those folks maybe are doing productions locally in a studio and they might have the talent right in the studio, but they need to actually access that equipment remotely. Or even, you know, right. remotely could be in another room in the same office. And, um, you know, our, our hardware allows you to do that where you can keep a safe distance, you can keep that you know, that six meters apart, uh, six feet apart rather, um, and just even be in another another closed room entirely and not actually have to be in the same physical space as the hardware itself. Now we've got some more as well. Have you used SRT yet? So we're looking at about 40% um, okay. have used it. 50% uh, are saying no, but they plan to right away. And um, okay, great. And you got a few other results. But Dave, you're looking at some of the questions that we had? Yeah, we got a few. Um, so someone was asking quite a while ago about what about sharing presentations from Google Meet? So we happen to be using Zoom to share the presentation into our production. Um, Cameron, I don't know if you've tried Google Meet. I don't see why that wouldn't work. Um, we happen to choose Zoom, but have you had a chance to, to try it with Google Meet and know if there's any caveats there? Uh, not, not really. Uh, Google works in very much the same way as Zoom. Uh, there's a desktop app available, which allows you to have some more control over how things are presented, and uh, the web app works well also. Um, Google is obviously a free, can be a free platform depending on what level you're using. So if you have a Gmail account, you'd have access to that. And really, we use Zoom because Zoom is part of our uh, corporate backbone for our phone network and a lot of the other things we're using. Again, you know, I said this earlier, we were using Zoom before it was cool, before <laughs> everyone else in the world was using it. Um, 
Yeah. And so we're, we're fairly agnostic to what video conferencing platform. We've tested out Skype. We've tested out uh, Google Meet. Anything that you can share a screen share in works really well. And really when it comes to screen shares, if you don't have a lot of animation, if you're not running videos in those screen shares, um, these platforms work really well because it's a lower frame rate. So you're able to get that high quality without eating up a whole lot of bandwidth, which makes it, works really, makes it work really well within video conferencing software. Perfect. So we've got one that's got a few votes here. And the answer is how to integrate an MP4 file into a show that's being produced with a Perl 2. So maybe you can talk about how we do that. We didn't do that today, but we often do in our productions bring in other media. Um, maybe you can talk them through that. Yeah, for sure. So we have a couple of different options when it comes to the Perl 2 and the, and the Perl Mini. We actually have RCA jacks right on the back where you can connect, um, connect an external device. Maybe you can connect an iPod, an iPod. Do people still have iPods? I don't even know. Um, you could connect an external source like a computer via stereo jack, and you could even bring in audio via HDMI. So using one of the HDMI sources on the back of the Pearl, you can bring in something maybe from an external computer like a laptop or on your mixer too. We could bring in audio on this mixer and just bring it in as another channel and again playing from other source, maybe something that's looping. Um, or a media file located on your computer. So it's fairly uh, fairly simple to inject that kind of media right into your production. Okay. Here's a little more complex one, um, but we'll get through it. Uh, it's asking, how is the latency between all of the different inputs and the possibility that the external presenters could watch this through Zoom? Um, and then it makes a comment, if, talking about these things, like latency is very cr critical to to the kind of experience of, of the production, especially for the, the participants in the production. Um, and then he also mentioned six Pearl Minis. That's a, that's a lot of Pearl Minis. If you have six guests coming in, um, it is. But I, I would say this about the latency. Um, the latency that you're seeing as a viewer of Crowdcast is a little bit longer. Um, so there's some latency for my feed to get on its SRT path up to the production and then for us to encode that and get it out to Crowdcast and then for Crowdcast to actually distribute it out to wherever you, in the world you happen to be. So you're seeing a significant lag in the order of seconds. Um, mm -hmm. But for us on the, on the production side, Cameron and I are communicating very immediately over Zoom. And the reason we use Zoom is so that we have freedom to set the latency on our SRT signals higher if we want to. And that allows us to allow SRT to do really well over these unpredictable networks like the one I have today where I'm bouncing between zero and 20% packet loss and my round trip time is all over the map. I have a very unstable connection, but as you can see through this webinar, SRTs really manage that extremely well. And the way it does that is we increase the latency that SRT can use to deliver the signal to the production uh, Pearl, and that allows it to do all of the retransmissions and error correction under the hood. But that latency only gets fed into the production side. So it adds a little bit of latency into what you guys would be seeing through Crowdcast, but that's already in the order of seconds. It doesn't add any latency for Cameron and I as participants that are kind of watching or participating in this the conference live. So Cameron and I don't see that delay. Certainly Adam sees it as he's doing the production switching and you guys will see it but not notice it in the feed that you're watching because you can't see when I'm really moving my hands and, and when you're seeing me move my hands. So we don't notice it on the production side. Um, so it, it, it doesn't bother Cameron and I and we can increase that latency as much as we need to in order to combat the, the unpredictability of the networks we're operating with. But you guys will see a slight increase on your side, but it's already in the order of seconds. So hopefully that answers the question in terms of the latency. And in terms of the six guests, well, what one of the features that SRT has is it allows you to set the latency for each guest. And you could set those differently, but what we do in our production is we set them the same. So when we did the setup uh, this afternoon for, for this particular event, my network was very poor, Cameron's was much better, but we both set our latency 
to the same thing um, that would work well on my network. And so that was how we set the latency um, so that Cameron and I appear in sync for you. Um, we set our latency similarly on our SRT connection so that everything's lined up when it gets to the production Perl and things can be produced from there. Yeah, I think, um, I, think that's, I think that sums it up pretty well, Dave. The um, one thing maybe just to clarify, I think a little bit from the question what I was getting from it was that um, for local confidence monitoring via Zoom, that latency is extremely low. So obviously Zoom, it's right. only transmitting at like 360. It's not a huge, it's not a, uh, a great amount of, it's not a <clears throat> very high resolution, but it allows for that video to be uh, transferred from Zoom very, very quickly. So right now I'm actually looking at the clock uh, on here and compared to the output, and it's within a second or so um, between the actual time that's coming out of the Pearl so that Dave and I can see what the mix looks like so that we have confidence right. in knowing what the layout is, if it's on a screen share, maybe if Dave's talking, I can take a sip of water or scratch my nose or, or whatever and actually be able to see that live. But, um, but yeah, I think, I think that answers that one pretty well. Awesome. We have another one that says, is there a way to add captioning into the Pearl 2 or a roadmap to achieve this? Some customers ask to add captions in Spanish or English in real time. And then mentions there are there are some tools like streamtext.net um, that have an API to kind of do this kind of thing into tools like Adobe Connect. Um, so the answer is yes, there's a way to do it kind of right now. Um, and we'll be adding, I would say, maybe a, a smoother way to do it in, in the future. Um, but we have a separate product we call LiveScript that does live captioning for you. So it allows you to be having a live event and we take the audio directly into live script and we'll produce live transcription of that audio in real time. And then you can feed that. It comes out as a video signal out of HDMI output and you can feed that into your Perl and then either put it side by side with your video content or crop it and put it as a lower third. So there is a way to kind of use live script and Perl 2 together to get real-time live captioning uh, directly into your production. And we had a, uh, a webinar, I can't remember how many weeks ago, but recently that talked all about the live script and we did a demonstration of having kind of live captions across as side-by-sides and lower thirds and that kind of thing. So yes, it is possible. Um, and yes, there will be some things on the roadmap that will enhance that as, as we go forward. Um, let me just see another question here. There's one that says, can you also hear real-time program audio during the switching? So I think this, Cameron, is more one from the producer's point of view, is asking what does the producer hear in terms of the audio or program audio when you're doing the actual production and the switching as a producer? Yeah, for sure. So we have a couple of different options um, that you can use. Now, uh, previous to kind of tuning up our configuration and making it work really well, we actually just used YouTube Studio. So for uh, YouTube itself, when you're broadcasting to YouTube, before you start your stream, you have an opportunity to monitor the stream. You can do some testing, listen to the audio. So initially when we got started, we were actually using YouTube to listen to that audio as it came out of the production. Now, um, you know, we found that this wasn't super efficient because YouTube has a little bit of a delay just as the nature of RTMP. So the producer would be hearing and then giving some direction for the, the talent and making changes. And it would take a few, uh, you know, about 30, 20 to 30 seconds for that actually trickle down. But again, using SRT, we can actually send an SRT uh, channel or sorry, an SRT feed of the production itself from that Perl. And then you can ingest that locally as a producer using VLC on your computer. VLC will ingest that uh, SRT signal. If you have a, a Perl, if some Perl hardware local in your location, you can also bring that in, have it connected to an external display, put that up on the big screen. You could be listening to the audio as it comes out of, the, uh, of your Perl, either a Perl 2 or a Perl Mini. You can even have it go to your phone. So there's some really cool tools. Uh, High Vision makes an SRT monitoring app. You can have it go right to your phone. You'll be able to monitor that and listen to it on your headphones. And of course, with SRT, then you're looking at maybe a couple of seconds, two to three second delay on that, uh, on that program monitoring and hearing the audio in real time. So it's very, very quick. Um, 
and it allows you to make those changes on the fly as it's coming in. And of course, uh, your viewers aren't going to see that if they're viewing via RTMP for a few few more seconds past that. So you can stay ahead of that, uh, stay ahead of that delay curve. Right. Great. We have another one. Um, this one is asking, how do you integrate mobile phones as a backup for video and audio into Perl 2? Um, so I think there we would be looking at, if you're looking at for a contribution as a backup into Perl 2, as Cameron mentioned earlier, there are some apps that will generate SRT signals or even RTSP signals. There's multiple ways, but basically mm -hmm. you could use your phone um, as a backup, as a second camera, a second mic, and even a second network if you're going over the cellular uh, network with your phone. You could use that as a backup, send that stream also to the production Pearl, and then the producer would have two SRT feeds coming in or two video feeds that they could switch between in the production. So it is possible. We don't do that in our productions. We're running with a single feed. So if if my camera went down or my network goes down, we're, we're in a bit of trouble. Uh, but you could. You could certainly uh, either run an SRT app on your phone or use other software on your phone that would just stream like an RTSP stream or something else directly to the Pearl 2 that you're using for the production and that would allow you to mix and switch that signal in if the other one failed. Um, we got another one saying, how do you how do you mix the audio from the different SRT streams? So you wanna take that one, Cameron? So when it comes to actually mixing the audio into the different streams, uh, what we're doing is using our layout editor, we're bringing in the audio into that, uh, into that actual channel and then if we're talking about mixing, i.e. like mixing on an actual mixture and adjusting the levels, you'd be doing that locally wherever the uh, contributor is. But we're going to bring those channels in and um, we can bring them in as isolated channels. We could have both of our contributors on the same layout with the same audio which we've had throughout this webinar. Or you can even isolate uh, one of your hosts to their own audio on their own channel, uh, or sorry, on their own uh, layout. Um, and you could go as far as isolating that on channels as well, which allows for some mix minus if you wanted to get complicated with maybe sending an SRT return. But, uh, but for this production itself, we're mixing those right within the layout editors, and it's just a, a simple, a simple checkbox within that to select those audio sources. Perfect. And I got another one here for you that's an easy one because I know you've done this. Uh, it's asking, what about NDI outputs from Zoom and Teams to use as sources for Perl 2? So um, for, a, uh, for NDI sources out of the Perl 2, we have used that, and I was actually using that the other day between two Perls that we had in the office. So if you have NDI, or sorry, if you have uh, the Perls on the same network, then you'd be able to send an SRT, or sorry, NDI signal from one Perl to the other. Um, the other day I was using that to actually mix together this big kind of monitor between the two pearls which are being used for two simultaneous productions. Um, but yeah, you could do that right right on the Pearl 2 itself. It's just as simple as selecting another stream, selecting NDI, and then on your uh, receiver Pearl, adding an SR, or sorry, an NDI input and just finding that on the network. And um, we do have some, some content and some webinars around NDI and uh, it's really simple actually discovering these channels. As long as you have it on the same network, the same subnet, then you start that NDI stream, you'll be able to pick it right up into the Pearl 2. Yeah, and I think earlier we, we showed a diagram where we showed HDMI coming from one of the laptops uh, in the studio next to the Pearl that was feeding HDMI either for the Zoom slide share that we're doing. Um, but we've we've also done that over NDI. So that, that can be an HDMI or an NDI connection as well. So there's lots of ways you can utilize NDI from Teams or from Zoom into Perl, or as Cameron said, from Perl to Perl. It's very flexible, um, so it totally. works really, really well. And I, I apologize, I actually um, misunderstood the question. We're also injecting our titles via NDI. So oh, that's um, right. if, yep. yeah, if you're using a program that supports that, we're using NDI, um, or sorry, New Blue Titler. So that allows us to bring our titles in. Um, these titles, I'm sorry, the bold was turned on. Uh, it's a little, these are looking a little bit wonky. 
But uh, every, all the other titles that you saw fly in, that's all via NDI. And even the video signal that's in the background, so we've got this cool motion background that's kind of floating along, that is also an NDI signal coming into the Pearl 2 that's actually being piped in uh, using VLC and, um, and some nifty tools from New Tech that are available just um, you know, right on their website. These are all free tools as well for using NDI. Perfect. Um, we've got another question here talking about... Can you use an encoder to route other encoders through like a router? And it says like you have many encoders <laughs> pointing to one and that one handles the streaming out. Um, and yes, yeah. you can absolutely do that. So it's kind of what we're doing uh, with our Perl minis pointing at the Perl 2 and then the mm -hmm. Perl 2 forwarding that stream on. Now in, in our case, literally today, because we're going to Crowdcast, that Perl 2 is converting that signal from SRT, it's doing the mix and the program, and then it's outputting it as, as RTMP because that's what Crowdcast supports. But certainly, uh, if we were going into Wowzer or something else that accepted SRT, you could certainly just use a, kind of a production Perl to switch between Perl feeds or other SRT feeds that are coming in. So yes, you can kind of cascade your encoders and use downstream encoders to switch um, between those and do all of that live. Um, so we're kind of doing that with the kind of pearls that we have in our homes and then up to the production pearl. It's just our production pearl isn't, isn't necessarily letting that SRT stream through as an SRT stream. It's going to terminate it, mix and switch, and then it's generating an RTMP. Um, so yeah, exactly. I hope but that in, answers, in theory, you could answers have that question. Yeah, I think you could cause you could cascade those quite a bit. So, you know, if we were fortunate enough to work on the NFL draft, for example, we could have, you know, our six feeds come into one Pearl 2. That could be sending out one. Another six could be coming in. And then we could be mixing all of those together into a Pearl um, or multiple Pearls. But, yeah, you could definitely daisy chain them like that. Okay, we've got one, and this is kind of... I'm going to, I'm going to ask, this one comes from, from George. He's asking, what do you consider is the positive or negative in my structure with Perl 2 with four inputs and the output is with AVIO transferring to a mini PC to zoom to have less latency. I think he's asking, um, I think that one's a more complicated problem. Um, so I think what he's saying is he's got multiple inputs coming into his Perl. Then he's taking the output of that Perl and driving it into Zoom. Um, and he's asking, you know, what's the best way to, to kind of manage the latency there? Um, I think what you have is probably if, you, if you're using Perl in that way, there will be a little latency as you do all that mixing and switching and compositing before you come out the HDMI out and then through the AVIO and into Zoom. Um, so I'm not sure we can answer that on this kind of forum, but maybe uh, give our support guys a call and they'll be able to help you optimize that as best as possible. Um, we've done that same kind of structure here in the past before where we've taken what we have in a, in a Perl and fed it into Zoom. We're kind of doing the opposite here today. Um, mm -hmm. But it is possible to do it. There will be some latency, though, that you're not going to get zero latency through the Perl going going all the way through doing the mixing and switching. There will be some latency to deal with there. Um, but there are probably some tips and tricks our, our support guys can help with there to minimize that for you. Um, well, and, so and was that a, was the person that asked that question, he owns a Perl too, is that right? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Adam, uh, if you could answer me just on our, our back channel. I think Adam had figured out between the two outputs on the Perl 2, one had a little bit less latency, which actually worked really well. So what Adam okay. was doing um, on Zoom calls before is he was bringing in his camera and audio sources into the Perl, mixing those, and then sending it back out via Zoom. And the latency, yeah, it was. I think it was on output 2, and Adam's just confirmed that on here, and that latency was a little bit less um, than output 1, and it made it pretty seamless within Zoom. But when it comes to Zoom, you know, you want to have like as low latency as possible because you want to have that interaction talking back and forth. But 
like Dave said, uh, please feel free to reach out to our support team and kind of get some more details around that. Oh. And that's about it. We got one other here that talks about Pearl Mini working. Does it play well with a black magic design SDI to HDMI micro converter? Um, that one I may have to throw to our uh, support guys as well. I know they will know that answer. I don't happen to know that answer because I haven't played with that um, specific Blackmagic device. Uh, I imagine it does play well, but um, if, if you want a, a more solid answer than that, uh, shoot us an email, epifan at support, and uh, those guys will help you out and let you know what their experiences are with, with the Blackmagic converter. Um, and that was HDMI out there, of the black magic, right? Sorry? That was HDMI a out. Black. So SDI in HDMI out. Yeah. Yeah, their micro converter. Um cool. I know we've tested a bunch of black magic converters in the past. I just I'm just less familiar with with the results of that. So I'd rather throw you to our uh, support team to get a, a proper answer for that one. Um and then we have one that says does AV Studio require a separate fee or is it included in the Pearl product purchase? Um, so it's free to sign up for an AV Studio account. Um, and from there, you'll be able to pair your Pearl and be able to see the status and do all, do that kind of thing, start and stop some streaming. We will be adding some, some paid features to that platform as we go forward. But um, at the moment, it's, it's free. And the kind of features that I just talked about pairing the Pearl and being able to see some statistics and monitor and that kind of thing. That's, that's going to remain free. Um, but we will be adding some, some capability in the future, uh, which will be kind of an upgraded service. So more features, uh, for people who want to do more than that, uh, with their Pearl. Yeah. For any of the AV studio users currently, yeah, go ahead. all of the, all of that functionality will remain, um, uh, free when we uh, upgrade that uh, that service, but there will be some really cool new features that are coming out. Yeah, and that's it. So I think we've we've made it through everything. Um, I want to say thanks for uh, joining us today, and thanks for all your questions and your answers in the polls. Um, it's been it's been good to go through all this. If you have any follow up questions, ones we didn't get to. Or if you want more detailed information, either about the products or SRT or any of the stuff we've covered today in all of this remote production, feel free to reach out to us. Um, of course, you can visit our website to get more information on the products themselves, or you can send us, shoot us an email, info at epifan.com, and we'd be happy to kind of continue the conversation, uh, you know, share whatever knowledge we have uh, in our experience here trying to do these remote productions. Definitely, and if you're looking for more information, check out our website for our webinars. We also uh, broadcast live every week on Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, and uh, it's a little bit of a shorter format, so that's our, our live at Epifan show. We try to stick to around 30 minutes, and we talk about some really cool concepts. Sometimes we do some experiments. We might bring in a guest from, uh, you know, one of our partners or, you know, another, um, uh, you know, another company or maybe some of our, our users, but... Uh, but yeah, definitely tune into that. Um, hit the like and subscribe button on there if you want to see upcoming content. And of course, all of these webinars, including this webinar that you're watching now, is going to be available as a VOD on our YouTube channel too. So check us out at epifan.com for more info. And um, yeah, we hope to see you again. Great. All right. Bye for now. Thanks for watching. Right. Thanks, Dave. See you, Cameron.